Good day to everybody from wherever you're joining. My warm welcome on behalf of Economist Events to uh, this webinar on finance and cancer control uh, in the Philippines. Uh, my name is Charles Garod. I'm the Editorial Director at the Economist Group. And uh, I really do want to thank you, first of all, for taking your uh, time to join us today for what is, I believe, uh, a pressing uh, and timely discussion on uh, an issue of considerable uh, importance. Before I give a little bit more background on that, let me also firstly thank uh, our sponsors, um, uh, Roche uh, and MSD, uh, for generously supporting uh, this webinar and for making uh, this discussion possible. Just a few housekeeping uh, notes before we begin. It is best to use Google Chrome uh, to view this particular webinar. You'll find uh, the full biographies of all of our panelists to the right of your screen. Uh, and you'll also find a box with a selection of uh, further reading available for download as well, if you should choose to, uh, as well as importantly, a Q&A box should you have any questions for our panelists. And I'll be putting those questions to the panelists as I see them and the, as we go through uh, the webinar. Uh, cancer, just as a bit of background, cancer is the third most prevalent uh, cause of death in the Philippines. There are roughly 150,000 um, new cancer cases every year in the country and almost 90,000 deaths. Incidents, by some, uh, by some estimates, may nearly double um, in the next 10 or so years. And of course, cancer is a complex set of diseases to diagnose and treat um, with a heavy impact on the public purse and high levels, particularly in the Philippines, high levels of out-of-pocket expenditures uh, by patients. And financial impoverishment uh, is, a com is, is quite common in the Philippines for patients and for their families. And of course, the coronavirus pandemic has made things uh, more difficult still. Some financial resource, resources that were originally allocated to, or would have been allocated to cancer control and to help patients uh, cope with the cost of treatment and access to treatment have been rechanneled into the fight uh, against COVID, uh, quite often with serious consequences. Delays in access to diagnosis, delays in access to treatment mean that many cancers now uh, uh, are going undiscovered or have been presented late in a country where late presentation is already quite a serious problem. Um, uh, or else those cancers are not receiving uh, timely treatment or indeed um, uh, funding, uh, patients are not receiving funding for such treatment. The passage of, uh, in 2019, of the National Integrated Cancer Control Act, or NICA, as it's uh, fondly termed in the Philippines, provided, I think, a point of hope for cancer groups, uh, as well as for legislators, lawmakers seeking uh, at that time to give cancer control and cancer financing uh, a greater priority in the health system. Uh, NICA comes as the Philippines also is uh, implementing a new universal health law, um, which promises wider access to health care and a boost uh, in general for health spending. Yet I think importantly, and this is one of the things that we'll be discussing, I think, today, the relationship between the two pieces of legislation between the new cancer law and the universal health law, uh, and how much bandwidth and indeed how much money uh, there is, there would be for cancer control as the universal health coverage uh, law was being rolled out, or universal health coverage has been rolled out, uh, do remain uh, a point of contention and do, uh, does remain quite unclear. The fear, I think, of many cancer advocates in the Philippines, uh, both inside and outside government, um, uh, is that the UHC, universal health coverage, would take priority and that cancer would risk um, uh, being underfunded uh, and underprioritized. And these are fears, I think, that have been amplified by uh, the coronavirus. But even before COVID uh, struck, um, uh, I think it was evident that there were worrying delays in the implementation of uh, the National Cancer Law. Uh, and uh, the Cancer Assistance Fund, which uh, is mandated uh, as part of the cancer law um, uh, to ensure greater access to cancer care for a wider range of, uh, of patients. So this webinar aims really to explore the intersection of these uh, issues and to ask how 
NICA, the cancer law, uh, can, in a sense, get back on track um, and how cancer financing can best uh, be addressed given uh, the competing priorities of the universal health coverage uh, and the coronavirus. COVID-19, we all know, is not going to go away soon, I think. Um, uh, and so how then do we address, or does the Philippines address, uh, the mounting cancer burden that COVID itself uh, precipitates or has precipitated while also refocusing uh, energies on the longer term cancer crisis uh, that the national cancer law, the new national cancer law was uh, enacted to tackle. So those are the questions that we are going to be um, trying to address in this uh, webinar today. Uh, and I would very much like to welcome um, uh, and introduce our distinguished panelists. Joining us today, uh, Clarito Cairo, Jr., Program Manager uh, for the Philippine Cancer Prevention and, and Prevention and Control at the Department of Health. Um, Madeline de Rosas Velera, who is the former Under Secretary of Health uh, at the Department of Health. Carmen Osti, who is the Vice President of the uh, Cancer Coalition. Uh, May Delendo, who is a pediatric oncologist uh, at the Southern Philippines Medical Center. And Cara uh, Brottermuckle, who is the General Manager in the Philippines for Roche Pharmaceuticals. So I'm going to structure, as I said, we're going to move straight into this discussion. And I'm going to start, I think, if I will, um, with this focus around COVID and its impact on cancer. And Madeline, Madeline de Rosas Valera, uh, could I begin with you and just ask you what you see as being the impact of uh, uh, on cancer control and cancer care of the coronavirus, and particularly uh, the impact on, um, on patients and the way in which patients have been able to access this? Yes, thank you, Charles. Um, the current pandemic has put our health system to a real test. Uh, we're now in the top 10 of uh, countries that has been experiencing uh, this COVID uh, infections. The impact is not just on the medical uh, or health point of view, but it has become emotional and financially draining. We should be in the process of evaluating and reinforcing our capacity to deliver the needed health services that uh, the Filipinos deserve. As we try to evaluate, we also need to look at the, the disease areas that are of equal importance. And it has been emphasized that NCD is uh, related directly with the infections, with the COVID. And we should also look at diseases that are of, uh, that will have a cause a catastrophic, financial catastrophic catastrophe to, to the health system. So we just have to make sure that our responses to this pandemic will not just be on COVID alone, but will also address the non-communicable diseases. And cancer, as we all know, is one of the top non-communicable diseases in the country. Unfortunately, I think uh, uh, the effort now is mostly directed by specifically the financing of uh, health services directed on uh, to address COVID and had sort of uh, put the issue of uh, cancer treatment and uh, support on the side. So I think uh, we have to reevaluate what our strategy is at the moment with regards to addressing the pandemic and the non-communicable diseases. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Madeline. And I, I, let me just move on um, and see if we can get a, a, a sort of view from the ground, if I could. Uh, May, May Delendo, um, working with the Southern Philippines Medical Center there as a pediatric oncologist, what has been your uh, experience uh, of the way in which COVID has impacted cancer care? Um, so we are faced with a situation that uh, has trained not only the best economies and uh, the most robust health systems around the world, but has created a lot of impact, um, particularly to um, the, the Philippines. And I think that the current COVID situation is the, one of the biggest stumbling block to the delivery of care. And we have to look at this in the perspective of uh, COVID effects, not only the patients who are seeking care, and the general public, but it also affects 
the people who deliver this care. And um, it's it's sad to know that uh, a lot of our healthcare workers are who who have who, whom we have nurtured for so many years uh, succumb to the disease. And and so we are looking at an entirely different um, perspective. But uh, I think that um, we should also pay attention to the lessons that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is teaching us. And primarily this is um, uh, focusing our resources and uh, having the correct priorities. Uh, we have been very, very happy with the approval of the National Integrated Cancer Control Act uh, last year. But uh, at this point in time, I think we should pepper this optimism with pragmatism. And, um, and we have to think very hard on, on how we can deliver care. Um, another perspective that we need to think about is that the Philippines is not unlike any other countries. You know, we are an archipelago of more than 7,600 uh, islands. We have a population of 108 million. Um, you know, in, in terms of communication, which is really uh, very important in delivering services to just imagine trials, we have 19 regional languages, despite the fact that we have two official languages. So, so in, in, in a nutshell, um, apart from uh, dealing with something that is very urgent, we also have to look at the bigger picture. Uh, on the ground, uh, we have been working together to find uh, ways and means uh, to make use, best use of our limited resource. And I think this is an attitude that should be adopted uh, across the country, not only what uh, government can give uh, to us, but also how uh, we can contribute as uh, citizens because the COVID pandemic has taught us that uh, it's not just a health system, but also citizenship that is very important to uh, combat this, um, you know, uh, very difficult uh, COVID pandemic. So we're clearly seeing, uh, as you're saying, uh, May, and also uh, Madeline, a significant impact on cancer care from the COVID, uh, the coronavirus. Can I just sort of further explore that question, Carmen, with you, um, working with patient groups, working with the Cancer Coalition, um, and just the sense that uh, both local and international experts have suggested that uh, if we don't pay more attention to cancer care, particularly in the time of COVID, um, uh, where there's likely to be potentially a surge in cancer and cancer cases afterwards as a result of not being able to get to um, uh, the, the cases that were needed to be got to during this particularly difficult time. Is this a concern that you share as well? Uh, you're on mute. You're, Carmen, you're on mute. <coughs> Yes, Charles, most definitely. Uh, what you're referring to is the concern that has been expressed by oncology experts and practitioners, both locally and internationally, that all the delays and disruptions in care, understandable they may be, uh, is like a ticking time bomb, or some even refer to it as a shadow curve that we are not fully prepared for in terms of anticipating the increase in cancer patients who would have a progression of their diseases. One of the major uh, medical oncology societies in the Philippines undertook uh, research with their member doctors and uh, at least three fourths or 75% of the doctors indicated that their patients because of the delays and the discontinuance of care um, have experienced a progression of the disease or in addition that new patients are unable to start treatment. And with regards to the financial environment as well, in August of this year, the Philippine Charity Swiftex Office, which is a major source that augment funds of patients for being able to purchase medicines for cancer treatment, uh, the window for cancer patients was discontinued. And so that has been a very major hit, of course, I must also say on the positive side that our doctors have been very adaptive, have shifted 
to um, oral medication instead of chemotherapy, have shifted to fractionated radiotherapy, and have undertaken um, online consultations in order to be able for patients to still be able to get the care that they require. With regards to the financing though, uh, the Departments of Social Welfare and Development has stepped up, but still uh, despite this, patients now are experiencing more financial toxicity than ever. Prior to COVID, already 54% to 70% of outpatient expenses for cancer patients. But now, with many of them losing their jobs or many of those who have uh, husbands or wives working abroad coming home with no jobs to speak of, the financial impoverishment that is being created has really impacted on their ability to seek and to continue um, cancer care. And yes, as Doc May said, we um, salute all our very brave health workers, many of whom have tried to still continue the care for cancer patients despite the COVID effect on the hospital capacity. But the reality is cancer patients to a certain extent are like a neglected sea in the context of COVID. The forgotten sea. Yes, no, I, I, I've heard that expression many times. And of course, it's not just, a, not just an expression that's been used in the Philippines, but in many other countries where COVID is having a big impact on cancer control too. I mean, can I come to you, uh, Clarita, Clarita Cairo, um, uh, Program Manager at the, um, at the Department of Health for Cancer? I mean, this must be worrying, of course, for the Department of Health to, to see the resources for cancer being sucked away by another very difficult and challenging disease. But can I just ask you what, um, you know, how do you feel, given that COVID is likely to be around for another year, how do you feel that uh, the government can start to bring some normalcy back to cancer control, given the difficult constraints that are there around COVID? What do you think the next steps could be specifically for addressing cancer at a time of the coronavirus? Okay, Charles. Uh, the Department of Health uh, really acknowledges or recognizes that there has been uh, disruptions and interruptions in uh, the cancer care in the country. That is why in March of uh, 2020, uh, we issued the department circular uh, on continuous provision of essential health services during the COVID-19 pandemic so that all life-saving interventions, including uh, the cancer care, will continue amid the pandemic. And then uh, in July of 2020, we again issued the uh, interim guidelines on the continuous provision of services in uh, cancer diagnosis, uh, treatment, surveillance, and palliation amid uh, this pandemic. So somehow we anticipated the, the, the severity of this uh, pandemic. And uh, if ever, this will longer than this. And uh, one of the upside of this uh, pandemic, we were able to strengthen our healthcare system. So we expect that the cancer patients should not be uh, taken for granted. So can I can I just briefly come back to you on that? And that is that obviously, you know, you've put in uh, place some provisions to try and uh, ensure the continuity of care, uh, not just for cancer, but obviously for other uh, important disease areas as well. But my my sense is that, and this is not just something that's happening in the Philippines, but my sense is that uh, on the ground, um, you know, patients are still not getting uh, access to care, despite despite the fact that the government is obviously trying at some level to mandate that. But so what, 
you know, what could be done? I mean, there are, I, I guess, patients that are feeling that they would be, uh, first of all, uh, not very happy to go into uh, hospitals where uh, safe environments are not guaranteed. I guess there are uh, challenges with transportation, with money, with just simply being able to get to these places, with being able to then afford the treatment. So what, you know, on the ground, the situation doesn't appear to be uh, that good despite uh, the government's intentions, what, what can be done? Uh, okay. Um, the, the whole of government approach uh, has been the weakest link in the approach to cancer care. So with this pandemic, we should uh, facilitate or fast track the whole government approach. So you mentioned that the transportation uh, problem of our cancer patient and social welfare and development. It's their mandate. And uh, the food, the, the allowance of uh, the patients, including their, their guardians, should be shouldered by the Department of Social Welfare and Development. And uh, the Department of Health should ensure the availability of services, especially for treatment, uh, palliation. So you, the screening can be, you know, uh, pushed back because uh, we need to limit the exposure of our people, especially uh, those uh, uh, services, hospitals. Clarita, can I come? I'll come back to some of those issues a little bit later if I can, because quite clearly there are lots of things that we, we need to unpack, and uh, uh, particularly around the financing question. Uh, let's come back to that. But, uh, Cara uh, Bretonmarkle, can I just come to you um, and ask your observations around this question from the private sector point of view. How do you see um, the COVID, uh, the coronavirus impacting cancer care? And what does, you know, Roche as a private sector pharmaceutical company, uh, how, how is it uh, responding to this process? Yeah, I think I uh, would very much echo some of the observations from our other panelists here. I think COVID has really highlighted the fact that um, this is not just a health issue, but uh, a whole e economic issue as well, and that these are, are very much tied together. And of course, all of the observations that have been mentioned in terms of the impact to cancer patients, I think are um, very much in line with what we observe as well. I mean, these are, are among the most vulnerable. Uh, we see that, you know, with the, the data from the, the uh, US FDA that they're 16 times more likely to suffer death of getting COVID. Um, and as was pointed out, we're seeing delays and disruptions in terms of how they're able to uh, get their treatment and get it safely. Um, and of course, there will be this potential impact if people are not actually getting diagnosed because we know early diagnosis is very important to a prognosis as well. Um, so, you know, I very much appreciate the fact that there have been a lot of different areas and sectors coming together to solve for this, because I think it does require a really collaborative approach. And so from um, a private sector side, our intent is to work with all the other stakeholders to identify where those pain points are and how we can address them. And it can be something as, you know, it, it's simple, but it's very pragmatic. How do we get patients transported? Uh, with the transportation system being disrupted all the way through to uh, supporting them financially and then even more holistically when it comes to uh, providing uh, self-care uh, options and support as well. So I think that these are some of the ways that we are trying to address by working with others within the system uh, to determine how we can make the system more flexible at this time and make sure that patients can either get safely to their care or even by innovating the way that we take care to the patients, whether it's, uh, you know, as suggested by the, the PSMO that we look into alternative ways of providing 
uh, therapy through whether it's oral treatment or even subcutaneous injection, where that will keep patients um, away from the hospital for longer. So I, I think we're trying a lot of different solutions and it's about you know, continuing to work together to make sure that those solutions are really supporting patients the way that they, they need right now. Thank you. Uh, Carmen, you had a, you had a point. Yeah, I oh, Mace. Uh, May, Carmen and then May. Yeah, here. Um, if I may jump in, uh, I would like to say a bit more to the point of view. On the ground situation in cancer delivery, and um, ever since the start of the pandemic, we at the Cancer Institute have not really stopped our operations, but um, it is trying to find a balance of uh, protecting our healthcare workers, the patients who come to us, and uh, facilitating the con uh, continue, uh, continuity of care, not only for our pediatrics, but for our um, adult uh, patients. And uh, this has, um, uh, this has um, uh, taken uh, the, um, the contribution, not only of the Department of Health, uh, but also the community and, uh, and the surrounding places around us. Uh, we at Southern Philippines uh, Medical Center, we are the end referral center on the second biggest island in the country. And for the past years, we have established relationships with uh, shared care networks around of us. And we found that uh, during this, uh, these times of uh, pandemic, they have been the uh, saving grace for most of our uh, patients. So we have shared care facilities in Northern Mindanao Medical Center, in Davao Regional, um, uh, medical center, and we have uh, a few private facilities that have been working with us for, for the past um, several years. And we have been trying to develop and strengthen uh, the capacities of these places. And although this might not be a, a template that could be applicable uh, across the country, but we felt that this is something that works very well uh, with us, particularly in the advent of uh, the pandemic. So, um, and uh, our, our societies, both for pediatrics and for adult oncology, have certain guidelines with regards on what to do with, with patients who are uh, unable to go for radiotherapy, do we give uh, chemotherapy in the, meanwhile, uh, in the meantime? And, and so uh, communication and teamwork, uh, you know, when, we, when you have very limited resources, I think it's very important to put your heads together and try to find uh, solutions that work very well wherever you are. And as I have um, preambled uh, earlier, earlier on, what applies in one area of the country may not uh, necessarily apply in the rest of the country. Because if you could, uh, come to think of it, Metro Manila alone, the population is 25 million. But um, the, the whole population of Mindanao is 25 million. So in terms of transportation, which you said, um, uh, coming back to the hospital, that in itself is a challenge. But, uh, you know, other, other organizations, and, and I really admire, you know, the Cancer Coalition and then non-government organizations that step in the gap where government is unable to do certain things like uh, providing transportation for patients coming to the hospital or providing transient homes so that they don't have to go back where they are and they could continue with their treatment. So there are many solutions that I think people and teams can think about in the context of, the, of their situation. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that there are a lot of people both in government and outside of government who wants uh, to help in this situation, because this involves not only um, healthcare, but the rest of us. Great. Well, let me just come briefly, since you mentioned uh, the Cancer Coalition there, and I think this whole question, as you say, of bringing the universe of cancer care, the, all of those people that collaborate in this process, from private sector all the way through to civil society, is enormously important. But Carmen, you had a point uh, to raise as well around COVID. Yeah, I was going to pick up um, what Doc Kla said and what Kara said, that really it's a whole of government and whole of society in terms of solutions. In the whole of government context, we have found that local government units are now playing a very important role as well in terms of uh, COVID control, also can still play an even bigger role in terms of protection and as well as assistance and support to cancer patients and their families during COVID times. With regards to transportation, 
issue, for example, Cancer Coalition pioneered uh, free transportation for cancer patients. And with some local governments in Metro Manila, as well as in the Visayas, we were able to engage the local government units to be the one to provide these facilities when private facilities were not available. At the same time, in terms of medical assistance and support and paying bills, when patients are not able to pay bills and there's a huge amount that's not covered by field health, we have found that governors and mayors are able to directly call the hospitals and ask them to be able to lessen the fees that will be paid so that the patients could go home and recover in their household. So we feel that the LGU, that the DOH with the DILG can still engage the LGU even more in terms of cancer control and as well as uh, protection and uh, uh, of the patients. But the other point as well in terms of whole of society, we saw during this COVID, the unprecedented private sector infusion of funds to really help the government and we feel that this is an area that can also be accessed for the assistance and support of patients, especially in the area of access to medicines. Because we know that even if we have the treatment available, if they don't have the medicines, including the follow-up care that is required, then the outcomes will still not be as positive as well as we want it to be. And finally, in a recent meeting of Cancer Advocates and Champions, We've actually been having uh, meetings every two weeks. These are the major organizations involved in cancer care, both adult and childhood cancer. One of the ideas that was proposed is that in order to have COVID safe facilities for chemo infusion or even for lab tests, to have the COVID uh, safe tent. Right now it's being used for um, COVID care and for being able to treat non-COVID patients, but there's a proposal that this could also be undertaken and utilize for providing COVID safe uh, cancer care services. Because even while the interim guidelines that was mentioned by Dr. Cara, which we're very thankful for and was a successful advocacy of the 29 cancer networks in the Philippines was issued, we have found on the ground, unfortunately that they require more assistance in order to put this into place, especially with regards facility enhancement, improvement, in creating areas to avoid cross-contamination and other COVID uh, potential for infection. So really, um, if this is something that we can accelerate and move faster, then we will be more hopeful. So COVID, it, it, extraordinary times are, are bringing extraordinary collaborations together and also lots of solutions that uh, are, are there. Madeline, can I just briefly come to you? You've got your hand up. Can I briefly come to you to make a hopefully a wrapping up comment for this part of the discussion because we do have to move on, but Madeline, to you. Yes, um, so based, based on the discussions of everyone, this COVID also gave us an opportunity to innovate, innovate to be able to address this whole of government equity-based and life course approach and be able to access to quality and affordable care for pan-cancer patients. The, the ad cancer advocates previously adopted this connect and collect strategy, which continuously gathered information, perspectives, and partners to intensify support, sustain momentum and solidarity agreement on uh, priorities to address cancer. So I think this has given us this such opportunities to be able to do innovative uh, strategies innovative treatment and innovative uh, support to the cancer patients. And I think that speaks very nicely, Madeline, thank you to a point that was raised several times, and that is that, you know, what are the kinds of technologies? How do we get cancer patients out of hospitals into local cancer centers or treatments at home? How do we think about those kind of innovations? How do we finance them? How do we fund them? And how do we take the pressure off uh, the core health system? Uh, where it's possible to do that. And the collaborations, the extraordinary collaborations that are going on around COVID, I think suggest uh, lessons can be taken forward uh, beyond COVID into, uh, in, hopefully uh, soon, um, beyond COVID into, uh, into um, the post-COVID uh, era. Can I come now, I think, to what I think is the heart of our discussion today? Because quite clearly COVID has had a huge impact on the way in which cancer control and cancer care has been delivered in the Philippines. And, um, but 
at the back of all of this stands the new legislation, the National Integrated Cancer uh, Control um, Act, um, and uh, this sense that this is a this is this is an act which has you know the Philippines has been waiting for. It's got lots of strong elements to it. It's uh, re it's looking fundamentally at the structural needs of cancer uh, in the country uh, and trying to address those, but. Of course, the challenge is that whilst the uh, law has been enacted, it's yet to be implemented. And I, I guess uh, that also has uh, severe, uh, severe consequences too for the financing for the Cancer Assistance Fund that's part of the Act, uh, and uh, more broadly for, um, it seems at the moment, the challenges that the Department of Health has been having in trying to raise the budget for cancer specifically. Um, can I, first of all, come to you, Clarita, if I could, just to ask you um, uh, this, this question, what is, what in your view is causing this delay to the implementation of the national uh, the cancer law, and in particular to the uh, sort of effective, up, uh, the getting up and running of the, the National Cancer Council, as well as then as part of that, the Cancer Assistance Funds, what is causing the delay? Well, I must say that uh, there is a uh, conflicting priorities uh, in our government. Okay, you see, uh, the Universal Healthcare Act is just uh, one month away from uh, the Cancer Act, so uh, all our efforts are geared towards the implementation of the Universal Healthcare Act. And now here comes a uh, pandemic. So it's another urgent and important priority. So there it is. Uh, the, the implementation of our cancer law is now at the back burner, so to speak. That's uh, very depressing to hear, I'm sure, for everybody here. Um, can I, I mean, would it not be, uh, would it not be beneficial, do you think, if uh, the Cancer Council would in fact be in place um, whilst COVID is going on, so that it can be responsive to uh, the COVID situation? Clarita, would that not be beneficial, do you feel? Yes, exactly my point. Uh, the UHC Act and the Cancer Control Act are equally important, so they complement one another. And even if there's a pandemic, while uh, COVID-19 is ongoing, we can still uh, implement uh, the two laws and uh, they should not be delayed because uh, our patients are waiting for the much needed uh, assistance and services. So, I mean, obviously a sense of frustration, uh, frustration there, but can I, Madeline, as a former undersecretary, can I come to you and just sort of ask your thoughts about what, why why we have this delay and what it is that we that the Philippines could be uh, doing to to try and accelerate uh, the the cancer council as well as also uh, obviously other elements of the cancer control law such as the cancer assistance fund well, yeah I, I've been involved in several laws health laws and uh, uh, I, I know that if you try to delay the setting up of the council, it will further delay the implementation of the law. So the more you, you proceed, the more you hurry up in coming up with the council to decide and to come up with specific policies, the better. So as I've said, this, this COVID has given us also an opportunity to, to, to innovate and set aside uh, the important, what are the important uh, uh, decisions that we have to, to come up with the policies. There is a mention of uh, the, the local government. So we have to continue building on the champions, the political champions, um, to build on the strong advocacy movement, politically from the local government, from the national government, which is, we have Dr. Cairo here, uh, is expected to be the, the the health champions in the Department of Health, the the, the patients advocate champions, the uh, private sector champions, even in the uh, the business sector champions. We have to build on that as we are still trying to address 
this issue of pandemic. We cannot just sit down at the moment and wait until this whole pandemic ends. We just have to continue on thinking, on coming up with new strategies on how to address this and putting together this group of people who with pure intentions to address the issue of cancer in the country will definitely uh, uh, put momentum to, to how we're going to address this uh, cancer uh, prevention and treatment. We how to address our commitment to the Sustainable Development Goal 3.4, which we still have to, we're still lagging behind. So um, I think in, in a nutshell, we cannot just stop because our house is burning. We just have to, to do another uh, a way for which we can support uh, another issue, although it's of the same concern and of the same uh, value, but still, if you're going to think about it, cancer has more financial catastrophe, but it's more uh, financial catastrophe compared to the COVID because the impact is not just uh, one time, it's a long chronic uh, impact financially, emotionally, and medically. Thank you, and I, we cannot, you know, we cannot wait. Uh, we cannot wait until the house burns down. We cannot wait whilst the house is burning. We cannot wait until the pandemic ends. I think we all would agree with that. I can see everybody nodding uh, sagely in agreement there. But what is it that now needs to be uh, done to accelerate uh, the first of all the law, the implementation of the law, but particularly the fact the forming of the council? Um, May, could I come to you, and then I'll come to the other two as well, because I think this is really important. What you know, what strategies can be employed politically, um, as well as across the the very strong cancer universe in the Philippines, to be able to, uh, first of all, that cancer universe put in place was very instrumental in putting in place that law in the first place. What can be done by that community to uh, push the, the whole conversation forward? Well, well. First of all, I, I think we should go back um, to, to a certain premise. Um, you know, it's understandable that people would focus on COVID because it is uh, seriously, uh, um, it is a serious uh, pandemic that affects all. But I would like also to put uh, forth the view that it is also wise to invest in, in, in cancer, uh, basically because it's a way for us to strengthen our um, health system. Uh, not only in public education, in pub public health, but also uh, strengthening the capacity of hospitals because of um, uh, its multimodal and multidisciplinary approach that touches uh, not only the treatment of cancer, but expert, um, uh, expert uh, capacity. So um, I, I think the government should should see this not as a stumbling block, but as an opportunity to invest in something that will uplift the healthcare system. So it's it's a, a change of, of perspective and a change of view. And um, how do we um, how do we implement all of this? Um, I I think the universal healthcare and the national integrated. Um, cancer uh, Control Act are not exclusive. In fact, uh, the spirit of the NICA is the spirit of universal health care. You know, uh, for, for NICA, we want all, whether children and adults, to have access to cancer care. Uh, we, we want early or stage disease to, uh, to receive the best possible care. And I think the government should, uh, should you know, uh, make uh, strides to fund this. On the other hand, it's very important to have stewardship. Uh, we know that um, in 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 um, you know when 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 we are in a country with limited resources and resources are given to us, I think we have to make best use of whatever is given to us. And so it's important to assess uh, what are the existing resources that we already have. I I think that's really very wise. Uh, uh, number two. You know, when, when you are in, a, in an archipelago, I think it's also very important to, and this is the strategy that the Department of Health uh, is, is, is going, you know, to have regional centers that uh, can be, that has the potential to be developed and um, uh, where, where people can come uh, 
for for uh, cancer care. So the cancer care uh, uh, continuum uh, from early detection to uh, uh, primary, secondary prevention, uh, cancer diagnosis, cancer treatment, survivorship, and subsequently palliative care and cancer control is actually the whole continuum of healthcare. And, and, and so the, the government should um, take lots of strides and efforts to, to, to fund this uh, initiative because it's, it's the way to go in trying to uplift our system. I think your point about this being uh, COVID, not just COVID, but at any point that a, a law like this is passed is a tremendous opportunity to address uh, to address, to invest in, indeed, um, uh, the management of cancer in the country. And I, uh, the sense that also uh, you, the universal health uh, coverage and NICA are not exclusive. Carmen, I wonder if you just pick up on that, because to me, um, I guess that I would have seen COVID as, uh, as May was saying, as an opportunity to actually get the Cancer Control Act as well as the Cancer Council up and running in order to be able to manage and help deal with some of the real problems that are coming out of COVID. Do you see that as being a missed opportunity? Well, in terms of the activation of the Cancer Council, um, I think it's understandable that there has been some delay considering that the appointments have to come directly from the Office of the President and we realize that there are so many other things that they are attending to. However, um, having said that, since it's been one year and almost one month since the signing of the IRR, I think this is something that now can be pushed forward by the Department of Health so that the full completion of the members of the Cancer Council, especially those from the civil society organizations, can already be, be done. Having said that, I'd like to respond to the intersection of um, cancer control and cancer care and universal health care. There actually is a third uh, goal that is often mentioned in presentations about universal health care. And let me just read it to you in terms of the Philippine law. It says that part of it is to focus financial resources towards high impact interventions contributing to the Sustainable Development Goal, the Philippine uh, Development Plan, as well as Ambition 2040, which is the NEDA vision for all Filipinos. And I feel that uh, cancer care and cancer control would and should be part of these high impact interventions because we have been informed that a dollar spent on cancer care and control converts to at least a dollar 50 in terms of return on investments. And for children whose survivorship and extended life years goes up to 71 years for every life year saved, then that becomes even more in terms of investment. And since our country is very much focused on, on poverty reduction and knowing that this increased financial toxicity deepens and pushes our families and patients with cancer deeper into poverty, then I think this is a case that we need to make more strongly and perhaps with the help of the Department of Health, I now ask your help to directly uh, go to the Department of Finance. We have not really been speaking to the Department of Finance. We've been speaking to our legislators who have been most um, helpful and supportive, and that's why we have the cancer law. But in the context of budgeting, we need the Department of Finance and the Department of Budget and Management. And so we ask through this forum, that the Cancer Coalition and all the other 30 cancer networks be allowed that opportunity to make our case and to show to the Department of Finance that even while we are focused on resourcing for COVID-19, some of the sources from WHO and ADB, and we've had the chance to talk to some of their um, officers on the ground, they have mentioned that this can be, as Dr. Cairo was saying, also an opportunity to further strengthen the capacities of the designated eight advanced comprehensive cancer centers and 14 basic comprehensive cancer centers. These have actually been um, identified and, and presented. And therefore, if as we plan for how to be able to strengthen the health capacities, as well as human resources and all the other uh, health systems related to the seven parts of the cancer care continuum, if that is included there as well, then it becomes truly 
and integrated health systems are strengthening, leading to resiliency of our health system. Because as a final note, we all know that there has been a projection that by 2030, there will be a 70% increase in cancer cases. And even now, post-COVID, this tsunami of cases would definitely lead to a doubling of patients with cancer. So we feel that this is a pathway that can be followed. Alongside with that, with regards to the uh, pharmaceutical industry, we have also made previously a call out if there can be some form of collaboration so that medical assistance program and free medicines for cancer patients, given that the PCSO has closed its windows, could be initiated uh, together with the uh, industry. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, let's come back to one or two of those points. And I want to come back to cancer financing briefly um, in a minute. But uh, Cara, I just wanted to come to you and just, just sense, looking from the outside, in a sense, in, um, uh, in some ways, the delay in the National Cancer, uh, the National Cancer Act, and particularly the formation of the Council. What you know? What do you see as being the key things that need to come together um, uh, to increase and encourage the process of the formation of the Council, and indeed thereby the formation of the Cancer Assistance Fund um, moving forward? Yeah. Thank you. I mean. I think the point's been well made that this, the the actual law itself as it's laid out is extremely comprehensive. And I think as actually a global best practice when you look at what it provides for and how it would provide cancer care. Um, and so I think that really now it is about the, the step forward in implementing it. And I think as uh, Menchi very much laid out, there is a burning platform here. And we mentioned earlier that there's almost 90,000 patients that die per year of cancer today. And so that does show you the scope of what happens when we, we wait to, to implement um, the, the law. So I think there is definitely a need to convene the council as quickly as possible, even with the all of the different um, competing priorities that have happened. This is clearly um, a high need for Filipinos. And then I think certainly moving forward in terms of the dedication of the Cancer Assistance Fund. And I guess just to lay out, you know, what we would necessarily see as reasons for that or how we can move it forward. You know, if we take just even the example of the highest incidence uh, cancer, breast cancer, there are frameworks that are already in place that um, were how to respond to COVID for breast cancer patients, but they do take a, a need for some decisions to be made as to which levers to pull and how to support those. And I think um, it's definitely a credit to all of the different stakeholders in the system who have been stepping up to try to support some of those solutions. They were mentioned earlier, uh, community-based uh, care and other innovations. But I think if we were able to do that in a more holistic way, through the council, then that would support even more people in being able to benefit from some of those. And that can include things like financing, so more strategic um, support and integrated support. Um, and I do agree with the, the premise that there is a strong role for, for government to play there, but there's also a strong role for all of the different stakeholders. And I think that's where, um, if we're able to have uh, things like the HTA process moving forward, um, which will then also help to move us towards value-based care, we can ensure that there is funding for a broader set of people um, for the innovations that will provide the highest survival benefit and the most quality of life for the areas that have the highest burden of disease like breast cancer, like lymphomas, um, like lung cancer. These are all areas that we see high incidences in the country, but can be effectively addressed with the, the treatments that we have today. And so um, I think that I would come back to the fact that there, you know, we shouldn't think of it as an either or choice, you know, whether we, we take primary care strengthening with UHC or uh, a more uh, comprehensive cancer care, but actually that I agree with the other panelists, these very much work together because the UHC is the entry point and that can address some of the poor prognosis that we see today with late diagnosis, 
but there also needs to be something for those patients to move into. And that's where the NICA is incredibly important and can um, catch these patients and make sure that they get the best quality care so that they can return to their lives and being productive members of society and members of their families. And that's ultimately what we're aiming for here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Clarita, Clarita, can I come back to you briefly? Because I think one of the messages that's coming across is, well, first of all, obviously the idea that the UHC and the National Cancer Law can in fact work simultaneously, work side by side with each other, perhaps isn't a, a view shared in the Department of Health at this point in time. But uh, we've heard many, many suggestions of how potentially uh, collaborations, both with the private sector, with civil society and others can help the process move forward. Um, I mean, just to just to sort of put it to you, is, is there, what are the things that both in terms of the National Cancer Council, but also in terms of cancer financing, the cancer assistance funds, what are the things that potentially um, uh, outside other organizations could uh, help uh, the Department of Health with in order to, to move some of these um, important uh, steps forward? All right. Um, I believe that uh, we should uh, uh, practice participatory governance. So not just uh, the government people, but also the civil society organizations which include the, the patient organizations, the uh, non-government organizations, even the industry. They should be on board in any decision uh, with regards to the implementation of the law. Because uh, it's part of the whole of government and whole of society, whole of systems approach. So it's about time that uh, we should do that because that's the key to to sustain this uh, this law, and uh, not just uh, good in paper. So I repeat, participatory governance is the missing link in the, in this uh, implementation of the law. Well, I I do hope. Uh, that those messages, which I think are really important messages, as you say, Clarito, the sense that everybody needs to be part of this uh, law uh, can find its way uh, up to the undersecretaries and the secretaries. Um, but uh, Carmen, a very brief point, if, if you will, You're, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to um, point out that the experience of both Thailand and India reminds us that despite um, the implementation of the universal healthcare, a recent study that was cited by uh, ESMO middle of this year, is that 25% of cancer patients in Thailand still experience um, financial challenges, including having to sell their assets, et cetera. And 75% of uh, patients in India also experience uh, this financial toxicity as well as impoverishment. It means that we need to be able to implement both the universal healthcare law provisions and the NICA provisions. They are, as you said, like they're twins. And that's actually the reason why the legislators in their wisdom supported the move of civil society to have a separate NICA law from the universal healthcare law. They are complementary to each other. Doing one is not sufficient to improve the health outcomes for um, our cancer patients. Thank you, Carmen. Madeline, briefly, you have a point. Yes, briefly. Um, I would just want to hear where my uh, senior vice president had as previous uh, involved in uh, developing benefits for uh, the National Health Insurance Corporation. But you have to go be to the basic. Do we have a cons consensus guideline on how to treat cancer? in this country. We still do not have a consensus guideline. We have to come up with a consensus guideline. As we wait for this pandemic to go away, we still have to do some uh, note, pick, note uh, or work, do a consensus guideline, do a costing analysis, and see how much do we really need to address this cancer treatment. Involving new technology to address cancer, immunotherapies, and whatever we need to support this, uh, the cancer control and so, uh, treatment in this country. Thank you, Madeline. I, I assume that those guidelines would be guidelines that the National Cancer Council would be um, 
would be putting together, I, one would imagine. But, but since the council has been delayed, we're, we're not seeing that work going, going forward. Can I, uh, we've just got about 15 minutes left and I want to come to a couple of audience questions, but at the same time, I also just want to dig into this financing question with two thoughts. One is, if I can come to you, Clarito, the budget process where um, the recently proposed budget for cancer put forward by the Department of Health um, uh, was rejected by the budget department. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, understand if you're able to to tell us what the reasoning for that rejection was why was that element of the budget uh rejected and uh it didn't even get to the congressional hearings i understand so what is it that <laughs> i mean and that's that's a blow it seems to me for cancer control in the philippines what is what is behind that and what uh, what are we going to expect now in terms of budgets uh, next uh, for the next year in uh, around cancer? Yeah, you're right. Okay, uh, we have this uh, national expenditure program or NEP. Uh, it is the basis of our work and financial plan yearly. So uh, for the 2021 budget, it was. Uh, forecasted around three to four years ago. Uh, we have this uh, medium term expenditure plan. So at that time, we don't have the law yet. So that is why the budget for 2021 is very small or measly. And here comes the law. This is a, a golden opportunity for us to increase the budget drastically and we have the cancer assistance fund and uh, it should have a separate line M because the cancer budget is incorporated or integrated in the NCD or non communicable disease budget line item with this cancer law there has to be a separate cancer control budget line item. So uh, unfortunately, it did not materialize. So from the cancer control program standpoint, we still uh, submitted the proposed uh, 541 million pesos for 2021. So as to implement the cancer assistance fund in the law. But any uh, additional or new proposal for the budget for the working financial plan, it will fall under tier two of the NEP National Expenditure Program. And usually all those items under tier two can be paid by the Department of Budget and Management. They did not realize that there is a cancer law. So, well, uh, I didn't. I have no idea if uh, they just overlook the cancer control law. That is why they did not uh, approve the proposed uh, budget under tier two, because uh, the tier one for the cancer control is only at one hundred thirty-six million pesos. However, we still it's have a uh, hope to include the 541 million pesos for next year through our Congress. So they will uh, uh, ask or request the Department of Budget and Management to include or to pass the, the 541 million pesos under tier two. Well, that's, as you say, a little bit hopeful. One hopes that that route can be followed but there is a question uh, that's come here which sort of reflects some of the things you've been saying there what are the actions needed to be done by the different stakeholders um, uh, in order to implement the cancer assistance fund you're saying that there is still a possibility that if you go the congressional route you may be able to get this law passed but clearly briefly what are the you know, what can what are the actions needed to be done by the different groups that can help this uh, caf get off the ground as a matter of fact, Charles, before 
the signing of the 4.5 trillion budget by uh, President Duterte, I already coordinated with our stakeholders to knock uh, on the door of uh, the DPM, Department of Budget Management under Secretary Avisado to, to approve the 541 million peso budget. However, uh, again, it did not materialize. So it was finally signed by President Duterte without the inclusion of the 541 million peso budget. So now, here's our last chance for the senators and the, our congressmen to approve or to include the 541 million peso budget for the cancer assistance fund. So we just have, uh, have to make a clarion call for our legislators to, to let it pass, to, to include that, that budget. Thank you. One other discussion that's been going, thank you, Clarissa, very much, and I thank you for those, uh, th those clarifications. I, I, there's one other route that I understand uh, may be taken. The Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Philippines has been uh, un, in discussions, potentially um, in discussions with the DOH, potentially around channeling funds through the, D, uh, the DSWD through to patients. And the, there is even a discussion, as I understand it, um, going on about the longer term management of the cancer assistance fund by uh, or through um, the Department of Social Welfare and Development. Is that, and Carmen, can I come to you, is that a, an area that may uh, may bear fruit to uh, help accelerate the implementation of the Cancer Assistance Fund? Is it for me, Charles? Come. Uh, no, that was for Carmen. Oh, oh for, for me. I thought it was for Dr. La. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as the NICA law is concerned, the Department of Social Welfare and Development is also mentioned as a major partner, especially in terms of um, social protection. Um, about two years or three years back, the Department of Social Welfare and Development actually issued a memorandum in terms of medicine and medical assistance. And one of the categories there uh, has to do with um, catastrophic illnesses of which um, cancer is part of it. So patients have been able to, to access this. However, of course, we mentioned as with COVID, there were challenges here. Initially, the funds for the Cancer Assistance Fund, what was being looked at was DOH and PhilHealth. However, since PhilHealth is currently under investigation and going through a possible reconfiguration, that's the reason why the Department of Social Welfare and Development has entered the picture. Also because in terms of the Bayanihan Act, uh, law two, there is substantial amount that is being provided to BSWD for critical illnesses of which we feel that cancer is one of them. So that is actually a pathway that we feel perhaps could be pursued in terms of uh, the Cancer Assistance Fund, not in terms of the operations or programmatic fund, but in terms of the assistance provided to patients for undertaking diagnostics, as well as other practical needs, uh, such as um, transportation and purchase of medicine and follow-up care and services. So, so yes, we see I that as a viable option that the civil society organizations will actually be pursuing with the Department of Health Leadership. The other point, Charles, is we did um, speak with the DBM. Um, but the reason that they mentioned for they're not providing the full support is two. One, uh, cancer is currently lumped with NCDs and therefore the budget for cancer, you don't see it separately, though it should be a line item. It's together with all NCDs and what they've approved for all NCDs is only 500 million plus, which is the equivalent of what cancer was asking for. And we feel that while they're doing this because there's a government commitment to report on NCD funding every year to the UN because of our commitment to the UN General Assembly on NCD um, prevention and control, we feel that there has to be a way 
to handle this such that we can still clearly indicate what goes for cancer, which as you know, requires multiple treatment, a uh, longer time of treatment, and therefore is really going to cost more than other um, NCDs combined, even though they may be chronic illnesses in themselves. So, and with regards to what we have done, we actually have um, done a lot of reach out to our congressmen and senators as well. And currently we're in the process of writing a letter direct to our president to bring his, this to his attention. We're glad to report that we have gotten very positive feedback from both our congressmen and women and senators. However, uh, there is that constraint in terms of the financial sphere. And that's the reason why we now feel that we need to bring it directly to the attention of the president, who, as we all know, has a special place in his heart for children with cancer and patients with cancer. Thank you. Well, May, let me just come to you. We're coming to the end of the discussion now, and I'm going to sort of combine my own question with a question from uh, the audience as well. And that is uh, following up from what Carmen is saying. You know, in the search for sources of funding that can help um, uh, address particularly cancer treatment for low and average income earners, what are the alternative or what are the additional sources of funding that you see that may, I mean, do you see the Department of Social Welfare and, De and Development as being a potential source of that funding or potential channel for that funding? And what other sources of funding might you want to tap into um, to help with low, in, you know, low income people trying to address cancer, cancer treatment? Um, you know, earlier, Ken, uh, Carmen has, um, as mentioned, experiences in the region, and I, uh, we've we've tried to look. I know one country's experience is going to be different from another, but there's so much uh, that we could um, learn from from around the region. And if you uh, look at the cancer plans uh, across uh, countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, even Singapore, Japan, and Korea, I think what is evident is that government alone cannot uh, fund. Uh, the cost of the cancer. So there, there has to be uh, um, uh, consolidated efforts, not only from, uh, from government, but also from um, civil society uh, to step in whatever gap that, um, you know, that, that government has. Um, in, 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 in our perspective, you know, here, uh, what we are doing in, in Davao and in Mindanao. So we have several sources of funds. Of course, we get whatever we can from government, whatever is being provided, like the medical access uh, plan, uh, both uh, for for certain programs of, of cancer, but also there has been help from uh, private foundations, from non-governmental organizations, uh, from, from local government units that step in whatever gap that um, that um, uh, government has. But I would like also to stress a very, very important point. And, and this is good governance. Uh, people will not give you money if you cannot uh, take care of whatever little is given to you. So, so I, I strongly believe that there are certain things that we need to look and, and re-examine. Um, for example, I understand that when we are providing the essential medicines for, for, for cancer, we have the benefit of uh, ordering in bulk. But we have to consider also that across the country, you know, cancer does not wait. Treatment protocols have to uh, to proceed in, in the way that they're supposed to proceed. So um, there is value in trying to look at how uh, we, we implement uh, the medical access plan, particularly in providing essential medications across the country. So what I'm trying to say here is that we already have things in place and this needs to be reviewed, uh, whether and uh, this uh, needs to be measured in terms of in terms of efficiency and whether we can improve further on the things that we already have. And I think this is a, a sensible approach. And um, secondly, an another thing that, you know, we could learn from other countries, for Thailand, uh, for example, it has four population-based registries that where, you know, it, it, um, it, it bases the programs that it plans to, to undertake. 
two in the north, one in central, and one in the south, which I feel might be applicable to us so that we would have a, a grasp of or an understanding in what, where uh, our, our resources could, could go to in terms of uh, prevention, in terms of uh, putting um, cancer, uh, cancer centers or capacity in centers. So I, I think it's very important to, to have good governance and good stewardship of the things that we already have. Uh, and, and, and subsequently finding ways where in um, other areas like local government units, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations can also participate, and even the private sector, because there will be places where in uh, the radiotherapy um, um, centers might might not be in the public hospital. So this is an opportunity for the public and the private sector to work together, and and uh, you know this this can can only uh, be gleaned if. You know, people sit down and, and try to see what are the problems and, and how to um, address these problems. And I always believe that uh, we must have a good stewardship of what is being given to us uh, to make the most of whatever limited resources that are given to us. We always have this thought that, you know, there are no resources for cancer. There are resources for cancer. But my question is, are we making the best use of these resources? And, and, this, uh, and this can only be answered. You know, uh, a, a law is only a law um, in, in paper, but its implementation uh, really boils down to people actually doing it and actually committing themselves uh, to push this, uh, this uh, uh, program forward. So there are so many opportunities for us to fund cancer, but I think it's very important to work uh, with integrity and to, to show uh, results so that people will continue to support cancer and believe that cancer, investing in cancer is a wise investment. Thank you. Well, we've ranged far and wide and we've come, I'm afraid, to the end uh, of the discussion. Um, I, I think I might have time very briefly for a, a, a quick final question, but I think what I take away is not only a sense of the real challenges that are there, um, in implementing the cancer law at a time when COVID is ravaging through the country and it's extremely difficult to find the resources and the financing to be able to do this, but also the sense that there shouldn't be any waiting um, uh, to put in place and implement the cancer legislation and indeed the Cancer Council and the cancer financing as well as also ensuring that, as you say, Clarito, as everybody has said, um, uh, there should be much greater levels of participation in the cancer uh, control process and that across the spectrum from the private sector through to civil society, through to government, uh, that that collaborative effort is going to have more of an impact than, uh, than not. Can I just come finally, I mean, just, uh, Carmen, you mentioned, um, and one thing that I think is missing, I mean, there's been a huge uh, impact from um, uh, the civil society sector and legislators in driving the cancer legislation forward, but now there is a, an impasse, in a sense, um, in trying to get that law implemented. You mentioned, Carmen, the president, um, uh, and quite often what it does take is somebody to be a champion of this process. Do you think, very briefly, um, uh, what would it take, Madeline, can I start with you, Matt, what would it take to get the president to, to sign off on some of these things more quickly? A, a brief answer, if I can, as a way of ending all of this. Well, you know, the, our president is a very emotional person as well. He had a previous wife who had cancer, so he's experiencing some kind of an illness similar to, to the chronic disease. So it's giving him the, the solutions, giving him the other possible uh, ways for which we could address cancer, ensuring him that we have the support of the public, the private group, the business group, the patients group, uh, are all behind him if he will lead, be the political champion for cancer patients. I think that will touch his sensitive heart and will be able to realize that, yeah, we aside from COVID, there's more to it 
we just have to address cancer as well. Thank you. Briefly, Cara, from your perspective, how, how would you like to see the President Act here? actually all in very strong agreement that this is something that needs to be moving forward and moving forward as quickly as possible without delay. So not allowing COVID to be a distraction, but really more of a call to action to support and invest in, in health and cancer. So I think there it's, you know, providing um, what already is working and how we can further strengthen given that we do have a really beautiful law that needs to just now be implemented so that we can have uh, build on successes like the medicine access program um, to give broad access, but also uh, make sure that it's evidence-based and well-valued through the health technology process and ultimately that it's sustainable and that requires the funding from uh, the Cancer Assistance Fund, but also that public-private partnership that we, that we spoke about earlier. And I think that's where we would have a strong commitment across all parties to make sure that this is something that will live on and be uh, a wise investment in terms of how those funds are spent to support people with cancer to have the biggest impact on society. Thank you. Carmen, briefly, uh, and I'm going to ask you all to be brief now, the case for the president, what is it? Well, the reason why we're hopeful is because not everyone knows this, but when we were starting to advocate for the cancer law, one of the stakeholders that we went to and met was the president and his current partner, was a nurse and very much into palliative care. And he was the one that inspired us to push through with it and that there would be support coming in the event that we would have difficulties. The second one would be one thing that we would definitely ask the president is some form of emergency relief fund for cancer patients, much like the short-term assistance fund that we're now giving to the 20 million poor or to the vulnerable members of society, because we feel that this is something very concrete, very doable, and very much within his sphere. But I must say that you have a lady here who has a very close personal connection with the president, and that's Dr. May. Well, Dr. May, I, I, I didn't actually know that, but uh, now, that, now that we've been told that, what would you be saying to the president? <laughs> I'm saying that because uh, 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 President Duterte has been our mayor for 35 years here in the Val. And so uh, we know him pretty well, and he has been visiting. That is a testament of commitment, and I, I think that's one uh, very important sign of commitment. But what I would like to, to say also is that, you know, when you, when you are president, you are, you are not just president of uh, people with COVID or people with cancer. You are a president of everyone. And there are so many competing, um, uh, you know, competing needs around, around the country. And everyone is, is, uh, is important. But um, maybe if, you know, we, we, we could, you know, show him in, in such a way that, you know, this is something that will strengthen the health system. Uh, this is not just for cancer patients. Uh, this is something that will improve the quality of care that we give, uh, not only for, 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 for patients who are in the hospitals, but for our healthy population. Because uh, as, as you can see, you know, he, he, he has that executive order about uh, smoking. Uh, the ban of, of smoking across the country. So, you know, by, by those alone, you could see his commitment. But I think it, it is up to us uh, to convince him that this is something that is worth investing because it does not only benefit cancer patients, but everyone. Thank you. Thank you May, very much. And I hope uh, that message may get through, through to, the, to the president. But uh, finally, Clarito. Um, I mean, somebody once described, um, just picking up on this, uh, the points that everybody else has made, uh, describes cancer as a kind of Trojan horse for improving uh, the and strengthening healthcare systems. Um, uh, I think, May, you just, you just effectively said that. Um, what would be your message to the president and to uh, further up to the Secretary of Health? Yes, uh, thank you, Charles. I will uh, mention to our dear president that the budget for medical assistance for indigent patients was dramatically increased for next year from uh, this year's uh, 10 billion pesos to 17 billion pesos. So let's say uh, I would request that uh, 1 billion pesos of that uh, might be 
allocated for cancer patients. So one out of seven billion pesos is not uh, that that huge, especially that we have this law. And uh, there are many cancer patients waiting for the implementation of this law that he signed. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you all for, uh, I think, a very uh, interesting and I hope a hopeful uh, discussion. Thank you, Madeline uh, de Rosas Valera. Uh, Cara brought him up, uh, Marco Carmen Oste and uh, May Delendo, and of course, Clarito uh, Cairo. Thank you very much indeed. And my warm thanks also to uh, Roche and to MSD for supporting this uh, very interesting discussion. And I do wish you all a very good day. Thank you.